Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another week of the 90-Day Breakthrough Challenge. My name is Dr. Jock Mugire. This is the fourth week of November. During this month, we have uh, covered some important pieces. We spoke about clarity. We spoke about necessity. Uh, this week, we move on to speak to action, but that's because we have already spoken about energy just this last week. So we speak about action today, and I want to borrow for today's session from uh, one of uh, the books from which I picked very practical ideas to implement in my own life. And that book is called The Four Disciplines of Execution. So I'm essentially would like us to utilize those four, the, the four disciplines of execution, but we are making them the four disciplines of effective action as we prepare to create, finalize creating a personal development plan, which we will implement in December as a test. And then of course, implement it in 2021 to make sure that we have an amazing 2021. The four disciplines of effective action. I was reflecting this, this here in the US this week is what is called Thanksgiving week. And of course, people are going to get together. Unfortunately, despite the coronavirus epidemic, some families will likely gather in large groups, but that's notwithstanding, the essence of thinking about gratitude, of reflecting about what has gone well, what has worked well, the journey that you have walked. I was just thinking about my own journey, thinking about where I started from. I grew up in the village and went to school in the village for nursery school, primary school, high school. The first time I I lived anywhere away from home is when I went to medical school, graduated from medical school. And then the steps I have taken along the journey in between to this point. Then I see a pattern. I see a pattern where like all of us, there was a part of my life when my action was driven by a calendar, by a schedule, by expectations and deadlines that were imposed upon me by the external system by the school system, by my parents, by my teachers. There was somebody holding me to the grind and determining when I need to show up, how long I would stay and what I would be working on and how it would be measured, what results would be significant or meaningful. And that was the daily structure until I graduated from medical school. And when I graduated from medical school, that was a line drawn and now I entered a new season where I was working on my own. I have an employer, but working as a physician in Africa is nothing compared to being a medical student in Africa or anywhere in the world. That's because the amount of, the, of, of learning you have to do as a medical student is massive. There is a, a timetable, there is a calendar, there is a schedule which you have to follow. And somehow you get it done. I look at the quantity of learning I did in those six years I was in medical school, and I don't know how I was able to do that, to cover all that anatomy all by itself, studying the human body from top to bottom, studying pharmacology, studying microbiology, studying physiology, pathology, uh, dissecting cadavers, the amount of work that I was able to do in medical school, just because of the nature of medical school, it's impossible to comprehend. But that's because once I got myself into that environment, I submitted myself to the ex expectations that were leveled on me in that environment. I submitted myself to the timetable that was leveled against me in that environment, such that I was sometimes in school for 48 weeks, 44 weeks out of the year. And those few weeks in between, some of them were essentially transition weeks when you have completed this semester. In fact, in medical school, we didn't have semesters. We had terms, three terms every year. And so it, it, it left me thinking, how is it possible that in six years, I was able to learn what it can take other people, you know, medical students everywhere across the world. They learn in four, five or six years 
what can take other specialties probably 10 years to cover the same quantity. It all has to do with expectations and deadlines and schedules and structure, the environment that is created, which requires out of you, out of every medical student. And of course, then that applies for every busy specialty, that the expectations create an environment in which effective action is not only expected, it is demanded. For you to thrive in that environment, you have to produce effective action. And it doesn't matter what perception you have about yourself in terms of your academic ability or your discipline, you have to produce effective action once you find yourself in that environment. Effective action becomes the ultimate result. And for me, looking at that gap between when I was in medical school and the six years that followed, where I was practicing, but I was practicing an environment that left so much time in my hands that I had to look for extra work, what we call locums, doing part-time work. I would go to my regular job, whether I was working with the government or when I started working with a private employer, I would go to my regular job and put in the eight hours. And then I find an extra six hours to go work somewhere else part-time. Why? because I had been trained in a system that made me such a workaholic, that made me experience what it feels like to work almost continually. No one translates like medical students. We, we, we used to translate like it's regular. We used to sleep six hours. And I remember we would run from the library at 11.30 at night or midnight you are running straight to bed because you don't want to waste an hour in between lazing, doing something else. That's because the environment created expectations which made it natural for you to squeeze out of your every day, any minute you had. And yet when I graduated and started working outside, I found that it's, 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 it felt so light to me. But then I realized that it's, I was getting used to this lightness whereby I was essentially, there are two to two and a half years of my life between medical school to when I started taking the next steps where I know for sure I lazed too much. Lazed too much, not because I should become a workaholic, but that I would have moved to the next step sooner if I had continued putting on myself just a little bit of expectation and consistency for me to continue learning, to continue growing, to not waste time when I know uh, for sure what, what kind of journey, what kind of pathway I would like to walk, what kind of direction I want my life to go. So I remember when I, I made that decision to leave the country and go to the United Kingdom, I applied, I decided if I'm going to be away out of the country and I would be losing income for during that time, I would as well get a scholarship to pay for my education. So I got, a, I applied, got, uh, a number of nominations for the Commonwealth Scholarship, then I selected one that took me to a university where I would learn the kind of thing I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn medical anthropology to enrich my practice of medicine. And in addition to that, I decided to pursue one of the most ambitious projects I've ever pursued, to study for and complete what we call the United States Medical Licensing Exams. Each of these exams sometimes takes people two to three years to complete to complete it, especially when you're trying to do this exam after five to six years since you graduated from medical school. And I went to the UK with the mindset to put myself under expectations and deadlines and a schedule that will force me to complete these exams and complete the masters in global health I went to do in the UK and to also work for the Lancet Global Health Journal as a podcast presenter. In other words, I created a schedule that allowed me to squeeze out of every day all the value that I could squeeze out of every day. And apart from when I was in medical school, I can say without a doubt that that is the one of the years, 2016, one of the years that I can say undoubtedly that I felt alive, I felt effective, such that when I created time to connect with other people, created time to be on a Skype with my friends in Kenya and some of my friends, wherever they were, that I was present. And I was present during those 30 minutes because I know that I'm not going to get these 30 minutes again. 
when I went, when I sat down to study, whether I was studying for the master's in global health or I was preparing to interview one of the authors for the Lancet Global, the Lancet global Health Journal, or I was preparing to sit down and do a block of questions or to study anatomy or physiology or biochemistry, I felt alive being able to be present to a depth that I had never even known when I was in medical school. There is a part of your capability, I promise you, there is a part of your capability you have never experienced. Because I left the UK, went back to Kenya, believing that I know all that I, I can. Then I crossed to the US and started working as a physician, a resident physician for three years before I get my full license to start practicing independently. And I discovered another level, another level of effectiveness that, as, that you click into purely by the environment you are in. Because now I was in an environment where I was not only learning a new health system, but I was on a new type of schedule. I was on a, a schedule that allows me enough time to rest, but when you are working, the amount of work in your hands, you have to become so effective, you have to type really fast, you have to review a huge volume of a patient's records and be able to come to a conclusion as to what is the most important thing to address for this patient. You have to review a ton of labs and images such as radiographs and, and MRI, CT scan, chest X-ray, and look at a ton of vitals, look at how has the temperature been, how has the blood pressure been, how has the, the breathing been. You, you work under such pressure and you are dealing with such delicate outcomes that you have to switch into what you have to switch into effective action, no matter what happens. And the more I reflect during this Thanksgiving about what the journey has been like, what each season has required of me, what ingredients were the essence of effectiveness in each of these seasons, the more I learn how truly insightful this book, The Four Disciplines of Action is. And so I want us to use those four disciplines of action, and we are making them the four disciplines of effective action, because we are going to focus on action. The whole of December, it is about action. It's no longer about, oh, what was the most important idea? What was the most important insight I learned today? All these insights are worth zero if they don't come down to effective action, where I can manifest it in my life and prove truly that yes, I have learned it, but most importantly, I am manifesting it, that I don't even have to tell you whether I am doing it, that I am doing it in my life. You don't have to tell anybody that you are doing it, that you are applying it in your life because the results show them themselves. Your schedule screams out loud, your list of activities, your high value activities, your list of objectives and key results, they speak out loudly for you. They scream that this guy, this lady, this person, this physician, this writer is committed and they are on the journey and they are learning. This is, this is the time, if every time I have done such a long schedule of, uh, of coaching sessions, this is the time when it becomes very easy for, because, it gets to a time when you just have to act. Otherwise, the amount of information we share becomes intolerable. It becomes intolerable because your brain is no longer distracted, such that even if it's distracted, there is already enough ideas going on in your mind that have stuck in your brain that it becomes intolerable, where the only way for you to stay on the challenge is to start doing something. Otherwise, you have to find, your brain has to find a way to totally distract you, distract you to a point where you have all these amazing notes, but you're not doing anything about it. And so this is the beginning of breakthrough. You breaking through your boredom, you breaking through your inertia to start taking action some of the ideas you learned during the first week, the second week, the third week, the first month, this second month that we are in, to start acting on things that you even learned outside this challenge and make them real, make them manifest. 
converting everything, boiling everything down to effective action, underlining everything, discarding what doesn't fit and remaining with only what fits and redefining this week, this coming month with effective action so that truly you are igniting not only your everyday, but you are igniting this week, you're igniting the next month getting ready to ignite 2021 at a level that you have never ignited before. This is a time when it comes to either you are on board or you are off board. Because if you are on board halfway, you are going to drop off at some point. And unfortunately, you're going to drop off when we do not have this community because you're going to drop off in 2021. 2021 is 365 days. Or is it 300? Is it a leap year? I don't remember. I don't think it's a leap year. 2020. Two is a leap year as far as I can remember, but no matter, 2021 is 365 days. Can you stick to the remaining 40 days? Can you stick to the remaining 40 days? Can you show up for 40 days? It's probably like 37 or 38 days thereabout. Can you show up consistently for your life for 30 day, 38 days or 40 days on average? Can you? Can you show up consistently with effective action? Can you show up with self-discipline for these 48 days? Because if you can't do it, how do you know whether you will be able to do it for 365 days? Because 2021 will be the defining moment for your life, but you have to get ready for it. You have to get ready for it where you break your own disbelief by acting consistently. So that when you cross into 2021, you believe in yourself more than anyone else. And you believe in, your, in yourself because you have proven to yourself that when you create expectations and create a schedule, and create your own deadline that you show up. In other words, you create your own internal environment that requires you to show up at a level that you have never shown up. I am speaking at a level of passion you probably haven't seen me speak from because I am speaking to myself. I am speaking from, to myself that today, this week, effective action this week defines everything on a different level. 28th, come what may 28th, the commitment I make on 28th will be alive on 31st December. And that's because I am not joking around with 2021. That is a year that is coming to me as a blessing. And I want to get ready for it at a level I have never gotten ready. I do not want to carry any lethargy, any, any indifference from 2020, any drama from 2020. I am getting ready for 2021 at a level I have never gotten ready for. And I'm so blessed to have gotten ready in the course of this challenge. And you have been gracious enough to walk along this journey with me. But I pray that it's not just I that will cross, that you will cross with me into 2021 at a level of ignition and self-discipline that you have never experienced. So let's use, let's see, explore, just have a conversation about what the, the effective discipline, the, the disciplines of effective action are as they are defined by Mark Chesney in the four disciplines of execution. He wrote that book to be applied in business settings. We are picking those disciplines and applying them to our life. So the four disciplines, of effective action. What is the first discipline? The first discipline, I have redefined them in my own way, but I will still give you the actual uh, definition that he uses, the, the actual label that he uses. So the first discipline, the way I've defined it is narrow your focus. Narrow your focus. His label is focus on the widely important. Focus on the widely important. My label is narrow your focus. It's, he gives in that book a quote that he, he labeled as, as a verse, like execution chapter four, verse 13. Just, there's no <laughs> book in the Bible or any, any, any uh, spiritual material uh, labeled execution. But he, used, he gives a quote, literally we can boil everything in this discipline to this one statement that there will always be more good ideas than you have the capacity to execute. 
if that that by itself can summarize this discipline and be enough there will always be more good ideas than you and i have the capacity to execute and so here is the painful part what do we end up saying no to saying no to bad ideas is very easy we end up having to say no to good ideas so that we can focus on the most important ideas you end up saying no to good activities so that you can focus on your highest value activities in fact sometimes you say no to high value activities so that you can remain with the highest value activities what he calls the wildly important activities he calls them wigs wildly important goals you are going to narrow your focus in december of the goals you have if you could use one goal as a way to prove to yourself that you can be effective that you can turn around your attention if you can use one goal to become the compelling reason why in december you spend the least amount of time on social media what goal will that be there will always be more good ideas than you and i have the capacity to execute you will never be able to execute on all your to-do list but there is on that list there are the highest value activities that the day should never end from you having done them that every single day if nothing else happens these specific highest value activities must be implemented come rain or sunshine this must get done so what is your this there is the law of diminishing intent and the law of diminishing returns the law of diminishing intent is the longer you wait to do something the less likely that you are going to do it which means when you have such a long list of priorities that you are trying to pursue the priorities on which you end up procrastinating initially there is less likelihood that you will eventually get to them but then there is also the law of diminishing returns if you have three goals you are pursuing at the same time there's a good chance you are likely to hit one or two of these goals but what do you think happens when you have five to 12 goals that you're trying to achieve the likelihood is that you are likely at best to achieve maybe one of these goals and achieve it partially what do you think happens when you have between maybe 10 to 25 priorities or goals that you're pursuing at the same time it is called the law of diminishing returns the fewer areas of focus you have the higher the likelihood that those areas you're going to make some progress so when you have 15 to 20 to 25 goals that you're working on at the same time that you're focusing on at the same time the less likely that you are like you are going to make progress so don't get me wrong continue writing out your goals continue write and allowing your brain to generate goals to bring up the ideas because some ideas that you should be working on you have already discounted yourself from and stopped even thinking about them yet some of those ideas need to be your highest priorities but you have discounted yourself from you have the urge to become a speaker but you are like mm, people will not listen to me you have the urge to develop yourself as a consultant you are like hmm I will, nobody will ever listen to me you have discounted yourself by becoming inconsistent in the areas you need to read by not allowing yourself to study in that area by distancing yourself from the networks that will enable you to grow into that area so any ideas that keep coming to you allow your brain to generate that is the generation of the ideas that is you writing your goals every day giving your brain fodder in the background to think about but when it comes to execution you cannot be trying to execute on 15 goals at the same time what is your overriding goal what is your wildly important goal there will always be more good ideas than you and i have the capacity to execute do not submit yourself to the law of diminishing returns we when it comes to to laws we can ignore the laws 
you can ignore the law of activity and go onto a big skyscraper and jump down. The law will never ignore you. It will break you. You can ignore the laws, but the laws never ignore you. So the law of diminishing returns, the law of diminishing intent, where you wait long, you don't end up doing it. The law of diminishing returns, the more activities you try to pursue at the same time, the less returns you will get. The way I was able to get through medical school, the way people get through busy courses, is because everything shut down. Their life becomes about that course. I am here to become a doctor. I am here to become an accountant. I am here to become this specific thing. Except, unfortunately, for too many university courses, people come out as assignment takers, notes writers, and question answerers, period. Where somebody went in to study accounting, they come out and they are not an accountant. They can answer questions about accounting, but they are not an accountant. Too many people come out of medical school, they have the label doctor, but they are not doctors because they did not immerse themselves deep enough to develop the attitude, the discipline, the mentality, the mindset that it takes to become an effective physician. What is your wildly important goal? And this is something we have done for those who have been on the course, but we are rethinking it again. What is your wildly important goal? If you remember, we had spoken about the lead measures and the lag measures, where the lead measures are the things you are doing now to produce the result, which will be the lag measure. When we define our wildly important goal, we are essentially defining the lag measure. If your, if your goal is to write a book, the lag measure is the book. What is the lead measure? The specific things you have to do. So when we define our widely important goal, we are defining what the, lag, the most important lag measure is going, going to be. That's the first discipline. Narrow your focus. Narrow your focus to your highest value activities, which uh, McChesney calls focus on the widely important, your highest value activities. The second discipline, the second discipline is what I call take impactful action. Take impactful action, which McChesney calls act on the lead measures. Take impactful action, act on the lead measures. If you wanted to, for example, lose weight, you have the lag measure, how many kilograms have you lost? Then you have the lead measures. And we know there are many ideas that can be implemented, but we know about exercise, exercise and, and diet. So your lead measures revolve around breaking down this area about physical activity and diet and determining which of these measures because they are lead measures. In other words, what will you be measuring to know that you are accomplishing? So that when you take action, you can quantify it. I have exercised for how many minutes? So that it is so specific that you can measure it and quantify it. it two ideas uh, McChesney presents in the four disciplines of effective action that are amazing when you think about the lead measures is that the lead measures are influenceable. You can influence them. The lead measures are influenceable. In other words, by the time you see the lag measures, the action that is required to produce the lag measure is done. There's nothing you can change. It's at the end of the year, you had intended to write a book. There is no book. You can't change anything in terms of the action that is required to produce the lag measure. But when you think about the lead measure, you have the plan to write a book. You have the plan to lose weight. You can influence when you are going to show up and exercise for 30, 40, 50 minutes. You can influence when you are going to show up and sit down and write a paragraph or a page or a chapter such that the lead measures are early enough that you can influence them. The other idea is that the lead measures predict the lag measures. The lead measures are predictive of the lag measures, such that the lag measures are very easy to measure. 
They are very specific. There is a book that is losing this number of weight, that is writing this number of chapters, that is studying this number of hours, that is learning this program for this long, that is speaking to this number of clients every day. That's at the very end. But at the beginning, what you can influence and what is going to be predictive of your likelihood of achieving is the lead measures. So when you think about your wildly important goal, when you think about the area where you're narrowing your focus to, what are the specific lead measures that you are going to require? And are these lead measures the basis on which you have defined your highest value activities? Are your highest value activities defined based on your lead measures? What are the specific lead measures? What are the most important lead measures you should be focusing on? Because what, what ends up happening is sometimes we spend too much time in preparation mode. We spend too much time searching for the right diary, searching for the right shoes, searching for the right uh, swimming gear. When at the end of the day, what matters is how many minutes did you spend writing? How many minutes did you spend in, in the swimming pool? How many minutes did you spend thinking? How many minutes did you spend speaking face to face to the clients that you want to serve? Because at the end of the day, their web, your website is amazing and your Facebook page is amazing. How many minutes are you spending face to face with the client? Because that is the measure that is going to define everything else. At the end of the day, everything boils down to you are here to serve clients. Are you face to face to clients three hours every day? If you are not, nothing else that you do matters. Are you face to face with the book that you are writing? If you are not, nothing else matters. You can speak, you can tell your friends about it. You can put it on your Facebook page. You can announce that you will be launching the book. All these are preparation mode. These are distractions. These are good ideas that eat up into your limited capacity to execute. When you define your lead measures clearly, it becomes very easy to monitor how much input you are giving in. And because these lead measures are influenceable and predictive of your lag measures, your lag measures becomes assured when you have effective lead measures on which you are taking impactful action. So the second discipline is take impactful action. As Mark Chesney says, act on your lead measures because you can influence your lead measures. We get stuck with the lag measures, the final outcome, because it is, it, it's not as threatening. It doesn't require me to change my behavior right now. It is easy to name. It, is, it doesn't require as much monitoring because lead measures are daily, are hour by hour, are moment by moment. You have to monitor today. You have to have a score you end up feeling bad that you are not showing up yet. That is the only way for you and I to cross from where we are to where we want to go. So when, when, you, when you create your, maybe this is something, to, something that he's, he gives that is extremely important. When you think about your wildly important goals, this is, I don't know how I should have, I should have given you this because this is so important. Let's, let's think about your specific goal the specific goal that you're working on and write this down, write this, this down. And because this is a formula that is so powerful, it changes everything. It's, this formula has three parts, but first of all, write it down. It's from X to Y by W. From X, the X, Y and W, those are just the letters. From X to Y, by W. So when you think about your wildly important goal, this is this formula, like literally, even if you learned nothing from this session and from that book, this will be it. From X to Y by W. From X, X is where you are today. X is where you are today. If you want to, to save a certain amount of money, you have to know where you are today. If, if, for example, you want to get out of debt, you have to know where you are today. If you want to lose weight, you have to know exactly where you are today. If you want to become healthier, 
you have to know the numbers. Where are you today? What's your BMI? What's your blood pressure? What's your average blood glucose? If you want to become disciplined, you have to know where you are today. If you want to minimize your use of social media, you have to know where you are today. Are you giving social media four hours or five hours every day? In other words, selling your attention at a throwaway price so that other people can earn from your attention. So from X, X is the start line. X is the start line. Where are you starting from? From X to Y, where do you want to go? The Y is the lag measure. The Y is the lag measure. That's where you will end up. From X to Y, that's the lag measure. That is the finish line. So what's your start line? What's your finish line? If we worked on one goal between now and 31st December, what is the goal? What is the goal? In other words, what is your lag measure? Where will you arrive? Then we ask ourselves, where are you starting from today? From X to Y by W. W is when. From X to Y by when. When is your deadline? If you have a goal that doesn't have a deadline, it is it is it can be an illusion it can be a goal you're working on but you want to be as effective as you can be when you have a deadline the reason why when i was in medical school when i was in in pursuing the masters and working on the exams the reason why it worked so well is because i had specific deadlines i had a deadline by which i had to sit the usmle exam i had to sit the usmle step one by end of february step two by end of april step three a step two, part one, step two, part two, by the end of August. I had specific deadlines outlined. I had to produce a podcast episode by the end of every month. I had to provide, to write an assignment essay by end of every six weeks. Where are you starting from? What is your ex? And your ex right now needs to be as honest, as realistic as it, it is. If it's not the truth, you are lying to yourself. You, it has to be true. This is where I am. This is what I don't want to accept. This is, this is what I don't want to settle for anymore. This is where I am today. This is where I am starting from. This is my start line. From X to Y, by when? What is your finish line at, on 31st December? Judith, how many hours would you have put in into R? How many hours of studying will you have put in, James? How many pages will you have written, Elena? Ruby, how many clients will you have spoken with face-to-face -face by December? So that you know how many clients you have to speak with every single day. How many videos will you have recorded on the content that you're working on? So that it forces you to master the content, to also get so comfortable with sharing this content. How many articles will you have read in, the, in your area of focus part? How, 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 how many articles in epidemiology and infectious diseases will you have read, Diba? What will you have worked on daily by, by that time? What new discipline will you have mastered on by the finish line? What is your start line? What is your finish line? What is your deadline? If you are adopting the same deadline like all of us, I will share with you the goal that I am working on when we'll see once I have really crystallized it. It's clear enough, but I'm crystallizing it so that it pushes me to do it no matter what happens. So number one, narrow your focus. That's the first discipline. Number two, impactful action. Act on the lead measures. If you ignore a rule, it won't ignore you. If you ignore a law, it won't ignore you. It, it will break you. There are some rules that he shared. I was just retrieving this because there are some rules he shared that I want you to write, write down. Number one is in when you think about your, your lead measures, I want to give you these rules the way he gives them because it's, they, they are so amazing. The first rule when it comes to acting on your lead measures, number one, what, what are the fewest battles necessary to win the war? What are the fewest battles necessary to win the war? I'm using his language 
so that I do not dilute it. So that then it becomes easy for you to interpret it whichever way you want to interpret it in applying it to your, to your law. So what are the fewest battles necessary to win the war? If you want to become an amazing coach, this can be the month when you ignore all social media presence and development because you are developing inside the seed which can no longer be hidden. This is, this is the month to develop the seed, the month to develop the self-leadership, the self-discipline, the month to show up in a different way so that you narrow down to the highest value lead measures. In other words, if you were to fight, there can be a million different battles you can fight. You can end up fighting 40 battles to win one war. But what if you could win this same war with just two battles? If you could just win this, this, this with two battles, meet a client every day, meet three clients or five clients every day, even those you don't think will pay. Because the first client you're serving is yourself, giving yourself the discipline, giving yourself as many situations for you to show up and speak and share with no regards to whether they will buy. Because this time, it's not on them. You are developing this one. You are elevating this one. You are creating self-belief in this one. What are the fewest battles necessary to win the war? It's if you are going to win December, what are the fewest necessary goals for you to truly be effective? This might be one of the times when you are going to ignore learning any hobbies that, that, that end up wasting so much of your time. Put that hobby aside. This time round is about effective action you are executing in a way that assures you that despite some of the time you may have wasted in 2020, 2021 is finding you ready. It's finding you ready to live in a way that if you continued living like this, your legacy is assured, your impact is assured. You will access a level of freedom you've never even thought possible. And you will live each day with a level of energy that sets you apart without even continuing to try. This is the time for me to turn inwards and release from myself a level of energy, focus, intention, and action, and intensity I have never experienced or even shown up with. The second rule when it comes to acting on your lead measures, what, what are the fewest weeks, wildly important goals, the fewest, the fewest weeks for me to get ready for? In other words, are there any goals that keep showing up but these goals are not underlined by the authentic desire I have for me to grow, but rather by the subconscious need for me to make up for what I may not have experienced or some deficiency or inadequacy that I think I have. The fewest wildly important goals per day, the fewest, the fewest but most impact, impactful, the fewest goals per day, per week, per month, per year. The fewest goals, as long as these few goals that you are focusing on are the highest, so that then you generate the fewest lead measures, but you only generate the, the, the highest. You will, I mean, you can have a, a list of 20, but you end up settling for the highest lead measures. And the, the last rule is every lead measure every lead measure, every wildly important goal, every wildly important goal, every important goal must have an X and a Y and a W. It must have a start line, a finish line, and a deadline. It must have a start line where you're starting, a finish line, what will it look like in the end, and a deadline. So that this deadline becomes the source of energy, the source of impulsion for us to act at a level higher than we ever done before. Discipline number three, and this is an idea that we spoke about recently. I do not know whether you are continuing to do it. Discipline num number three is maintain clear measurement. Maintain clear measurement. That's my language, maintain clear measurement. His language is keep a compelling scoreboard. Keep a compelling scoreboard. Maintain clear measurement. Keep a compelling scoreboard. And I remember that he, he gave, yes, I found them. He gave some features that 
that make a, a scoreboard compelling. The scoreboard must be driven by you because you are a player. You usually see, for example, in any game, let's say it's a soccer a match that is going on. The one thing that every eye lays their eyes on is the scoreboard. Now, when we watch television, we, we get used to seeing the scoreboard really visibly on the screen. Remember when the players are in the field, they're not watching television. Yet that scoreboard is in a place where they can see it. That scoreboard is in a place where they can see it. So that sometimes when they score a goal that is controversial, everybody's eyes turns to the scoreboard. And they're waiting to see what is going to be the decision regarding this goal. Is it going to be awarded or not awarded? Especially with these days of uh, the video assisted technology, a goal is scored and one side wants to celebrate, the other side wants to dispute the goal and everybody's eyes turns to the scoreboard. What is your scoreboard? Do you have a scoreboard where your wildly important goal has been broken down to lead measures and you are very easily able to determine on the scoreboard whether you are heading in the right direction, whether you are effective, whether you are continuing to show up in a way that impacts most importantly on the goals that you are working on, on the lead measures that you are working on. Here are some rules when it comes to a scoreboard. Number one, it must be simple. It must be simple. A scoreboard that is effective, that enables you to maintain consistent and clear measurement on the action you are taking, it must be very simple. Complexity always makes execution difficult. If you want to not execute something, make it complex. But if you want to execute on something consistently, make it very simple. If you look at the, the scoreboards that, you, you, that we have in the fields, it's just two or three numbers. That's it. There is the time, and then there is the score for this team, there's the score for the other team. Because what you're trying to do is to set a winnable game. You want to set a game that your brain looks at and says, I can do this. This is winnable. I can learn this. I can invest these hours. I can show up for this number of sessions. I can make progress. I can see where I am going. This is a winnable game. You make it a winnable game by having a scoreboard that is visible. When players are in the field, each team feels that they can win this game. They may not necessarily win, but they feel that they can win this game. They can see the scoreboard. When you see the scoreboard, you play differently. Can you imagine if players went onto the field and they are playing, for example, for 90 minutes and they have no idea what is going on on the scoreboard? They would play differently. But when they can see it, they can see the time. It is 90 minutes now. We have two minutes extra and we are one goal down, they play differently because they know what they see, what is happening on the scoreboard. Oh, we only have two minutes extra. We are one goal down. And if we score this, we will go to penalties. Or if we score this, we will equalize and we will have another chance later. If we come back later and win the next league, we, the next game, we will win this league. The scoreboard changes everything. Make it simple. Number two, make it highly visible. Your scoreboard must be highly visible. I mentioned having a calendar. And this is something I will reiterate. Get a physical calendar and buy a marker, a felt pen or marker, whatever you need to mark a big X on every day. And each day gets an X because you have a specific number of highest value activities. You implement all the highest value activities and you put a big X. There are other activities that don't have to be part of the X, but the three or four or five at most highest value activities, those must all be done for you to put an X on that calendar. And you put an X on that calendar with the aim that from when you start, if you are starting on 28th November, or you are starting on 1st December, you will determine when you want to start. From the day you start, you don't break the chain. You put an X on that calendar every day. One of the ways you're going to prove to yourself that you are taking a higher commitment is that you will find time to read through a page or two on Christmas day. And here, here, is, here is the reality that we, we make celebration sometimes, we make celebration more important 
And at the end of the day, we make other forms of interruption so important that you have a year and you count how many times you end up giving yourself that kind of break such that you create a break in your mindset where the end of the year becomes the weakest part of your year. And yet there are disciplines that will require you on an every day, every day you wake up so that when I'm showing up for this meeting with family, I'm showing up at that, that dinner table. I am using this as a way for me to be present, to be truly present because it has become a discipline that I'm doing every single day. So that truly, if I am taking a break, I am truly taking a break rather than reinforcing a pattern that has been happening every single time. If we, if we, if you and I learned to do with consistency what we do every single day until the discipline locks in, then it will make a weekend more valuable to us because when you truly take a break, you are taking a break intentionally, deliberately, rather than escaping from the journey that you are on, the pathway that you are on. And modeling to yourself and modeling to the people around you a level of consistency and discipline that is you have never even thought for yourself that you're capable of doing. Because I wish, I sometimes wish that, that the year did not start on 1st January because the year starts on a holiday. It starts with, it starts after three, two to three weeks of the lowest level of activity. People switch off their brains from 12th December, at least in Kenya where I come from, from the holidays on 12th December, if you go to government offices, everything is downhill. And it's unfortunately downhill, not only in the government offices, but in our lives too. Everything becomes about these two or three days, Christmas or New Year. And yet that is a whole month. And unfortunately, this month sets a rhythm with which we will start the new year. So we start the new year thinking like, ah, this first two, three weeks of January, it's okay. I will catch up. I will, I will pick up at some point. And it, it creates a negative pattern. Honestly, I wish if I had the power, I would move Christmas to November or to October so that people finish the year with a December that is active. And that way you get ready to start the new year on a, on, on, a, on, a, on a high note, but you don't have to move the calendar. You can reshape the calendar your own way so that you are ready to start the year on a different and higher and more powerful note. The third rule is to have the right, you must have the right lead measures on your scoreboard. You must have the right lead measures on your scoreboard. The fourth discipline of effective action. The fourth discipline of effective action, my language is commit, commit to consistent progress. Commit to consistent progress. His language is create a cadence of accountability. Create a cadence of accountability. Cadence is uh, C A D E N C E, cadence. Commit to consistent progress. You commit to consistent progress by not only measuring, by so commit to consistent progress through accountability and accountability to yourself. But like I've said before, I believe trying to lead yourself is a recipe for disaster. This is where a community becomes amazing, a community like this one, or having an, a partner that you're working with or a colleague that you're working with, someone else, who is as committed to their own growth and to their own success as you are to your, yourself. Showing up to monitor consistently, reporting consistently what actions you are taking, what direction you are moving towards, what challenges you are facing, and how effective you feel you are being in terms of facing your lead measures, taking actions on them, and monitoring your scoreboard consistently. So there you have the four disciplines of effective action. What are you going to focus on? Is it narrow enough? What, what are you focusing on? Like what is your highest value goal? Is it narrow enough? 
are you taking impactful action? Action that is driven by your lead measures. Are your lead measures specific enough? Can they be put the timeline to the, to the formula from X, the start line, to Y, the finish line, by, by W, the deadline, by when? By when will you have accomplished this? Will you have finished reading this series of articles? Will you have finished writing this series of, of articles or chapters for a book? By, by when will you have finished studying or mastering this new program that you are learning? By when will you have spoken to this number of clients? Then putting it on a visible, simple scoreboard so that every single day your aim is to not break a chain. Do not make December your weakness. And therefore set yourself up for a weak January because once you have a weak January, there is no inciting event that happens in February that will ignite you into a high level of effectiveness. One of the most powerful, naturally given inciting event for all of us is New Year. Let New Year find you so flammable, so ready to catch fire because you have been taking consistent action. You have a scoreboard that is very visible. And then number four, discipline number four. We haven't spent as much time on discipline number four, but remember the essence of it, consistently measuring, committing to consistent progress, and it's mostly through accountability. Accountability where you are no longer just measuring privately, you're measuring in in, in together with others. If you commit to exercise it, you have a calendar where you mark every day you exercise. Let your children know. It's not, not even your partner, spouse, your children, <laughs> because they will never forget that dad or mom committed to doing this. Or if you have just somebody else who will hold you accountable, they will never forget. It's, it's so visible. They come to visit you, they come by, or they wake up in the morning and they can see whether yesterday you exercised or not. And that becomes a powerful way, whatever it's going to take to create an accountability that keeps you going. We will see whether we can still do this in the new year. If my, my schedule allows, we can have a way, even if it's maybe once a week, or we'll, we'll find a way to create accountability through this community or i could set you guys free in your own create your own community and if whenever you need me you can let me know and you hold each other accountable for a whole year and see what happens whether your life does not change drastically those are the four disciplines what you will focus on what you will act on what will be impactful action for you how you will scoreboard or measure make it visible and how do you create accountability to keep you going no matter what happens? I know I have shared a lot today, and this is something I am totally passionate about. And this is something that I am doing, and I'm doing it at a level that I have never done before. And I hope you have found value from this session today. Now I'm just going to give us time to reflect before we wrap up this session. And today we started on time, and that's my intention that we I will show up immediately, I log in, I will start on time. I hope to be able to get access to this space in good time. And whatever time I log in, there's no wasting time. I log in and get started immediately. So let's now have a round of reflections and we will start with James. Hi. Hello everyone. Um, I, I think uh, the, the the, the best point I, I took away from today's discussion was the point on uh, doing something not to affirm, doing something to affirm your discipline and not and not what we found society doing. That example of uh, Christmas was so was so profound for me because yesterday as I was uh, doing the exercise and uh, answering the question of uh, uh, if you knew you if you knew you only had up to uh, December thirty first, what are the things that uh, you would you will do, what are the things that you do differently? So I, I, I came up with a list of uh, very interesting activities, people that want to visit, people that like to appreciate, but uh, thinking thinking at that moment, this, these are things I cannot do. And <laughs> these are things I cannot get myself to do unless I have, you know, uh, I know the number of days I have left and uh, there, there are few. 
I, I do not have what it takes for me to 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 do them because they they are, they are good things and I might have there the, are the things that I have occasionally used done previously but uh, I've done so with the intention of numbing myself you know I have I have used them as an escape and uh, in as much as I would love to do them they are very good things but I I can't do them because I I I, I have consistently used them to numb myself when i'm doing them i am not really present and i think i would like i would love to get to that point of the, the, a weekend meaning so much for me me taking time out from my schedule meaning a lot for me i i know it's not clear right now because it's it's something that i'm still developing but it's what i thought i'd share thank you thank you so much james that's that's an amazing reflection i won't even add anything I love you. You are very reflective every time you share you and you speak with such passion. I enjoy listening to you, James. Let's uh, now hear from uh, Elena. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, today's uh, session has been quite uh, introspective as usual, but uh, it really hit home. Um, the most important takeaway I got today is that uh, every widely important goal must have a start line, finish line, and a deadline. And just to check ourselves for that subconscious desire to make up for inadequacies in our goals versus the need to, to grow, we have to really reflect on what we take up as our goals and implement. So in conclusion, in 2020, I'm not taking any lethargy, bad habits, or drama. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. you. You have no idea how some of what you end up saying at the end of the session hits me and I'm like, yes, <laughs> I want, I want, I needed to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Let's hear from Judith. Uh, Judith, I think she, uh, she dropped out. Oh, no, I'm there. Let's see. <laughs> okay, so my takeaway for from today's session is to narrow my focus. I, I always like have so many things that I need to to get done, and having so many things, I think it's something that makes you not know, really focus on one thing and you end up not accomplishing anything at the end of the day. So and I'm just telling myself to narrow my focus and take impactful action and start small and have a deadline when you, when you want to reflect and see that you've accomplished this and this by this time, because that is the only way you can monitor your progress. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judith. I always want and enjoy hearing your internet. Is, it's like you are speaking from a radio station. It's so clear. <laughs> Let's hear from Pat. Um, I like, I also just like I think Judith, I like the part on narrowing my focus. It, it applies so much in my day to day life. I've found that even, okay, yes, there's a long term bit of narrowing my focus, but even on just day to day items, when I have so many things on my to do list, it really demoralizes me. But if you just decide, you know, today I'm focusing on this and this, you get to do, you get to achieve just that and you get to feel energized to do other things later on. So I like that um, by narrowing my focus, I'm able to uh, bring it down to things. First, you call them winnable, things that are winnable. I'm able to track my progress on that. And if I'm able, if I'm making progress, I get energized to keep on going. Um, yeah, so I like that. Thank you. Wow, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's I like that word, winnable. It's because we, we want to play, a, we play better when we are playing a winnable game. Thank you. Thank you very much. But let's hear from Rumbi. Hi everyone, thank you doctor for the great session today. 
So for me, what really stood out, it's the aspect where you were talking about the fewest battles necessary for me to win the war and be effective. So it just got me thinking that, you know, at times, especially in life, okay, in my own life, I tend to, <clears throat> to focus more energy on battles that are not necessary. Like, for example, if someone says something bad about me, I start feeling, you know, angry and I become defensive and I usually maybe reach out to them and ask them why they said that, but it only makes the situation worse. So as 2020 comes to an end, it's really got me thinking that, you know, if I'm just to leave that battle and focus more of my energy on where I want to go, because I want people to know me as being someone of integrity and as someone of character. So something small like that can actually tarnish everything that I've been working so hard to actually be able to achieve. So yeah, that really got me thinking from a character kind of perspective. And then maybe in relation to discipline, the areas of how, you know, at times the emotions, like how you, you say, oh, we, sometimes we can wake up and I don't feel like doing something, but if I'm able to push through that boredom stage, I can then be able to actually be more effective. I found that to be really true. And it's something that I'm, I'm currently working on to spend more time on actually having more exciting events and being focused in that line so I don't become as bored. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rumbi. Yeah, it's, I mean, these, the applications for these disciplines, beyond applying them for in business as the book, the, what the initial uh, material was meant, it's, it's uh, endless. I do not see an Diba. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Job, for the very impartial presentation. My takeaway from this session is the aspect of narrowing our focus. I just I realized I have both activities on my list to do, uh, on to do list every day, but today my what am I learning that not everything that I'm going to, not everything on those lists are important. So my takeaway is to is two or three high quality activities related to my high quality goals. Uh, so that's takeaway, my takeaway from today's session. Over. Thank you, Diba. Thank you, uh, Elena, James, Judith, Pat, Rumi. We didn't get to hear from Anne. I think probably her internet uh, disconnected her. It's been a delight to share this session with you. This week, we are speaking about action. Uh, this is Today's session is one that you, you could uh, return to whenever you can. And there are several other sessions we've done before. Because when we have learned something in a shared community, it connects with us very differently than when you learn something, you know, randomly. So there is, there is a shared mind we have created because of the series of sessions that we have shared. Take advantage of these sessions and connect, share in, uh, in with, with each other, share in the group, uh, share with other people in, in the group. When you share, there's, there's, there's a level of awareness it creates within you. Let's get ready for November 28th and get ready to live in December in a way that we've never lived. Get, let's get ready to maintain consistency and discipline in December so that we enjoy the festivities without allowing them to become an excuse for us to slacken and have to try to catch up our momentum again in the new year. That will be it from me today. Thank you for joining this session. I look forward to joining you tomorrow. I shared the list of what the other sessions uh, would look like and I'm thinking very intensely about what those subjects mean to me and what they would mean to us together as we prepare for 28th and for the new year. I wish you an amazing afternoon everyone and Judith I wish you a great day. I look forward to see you tomorrow at the next session. My name is Dr. Job Mogire from the House of Mastery.